Tara, I want to bring a second person into this conversation. I want to go from uh, uh, Nemoag Camp, where you are in northern Minnesota, uh, to South Dakota. This week, the Republican governor there, Kristi Noem, announced she's deploying 50 members of the South Dakota National Guard to the U.S.-Mexico border at the request of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. But there's a twist. The deployment is being paid for by billionaire Republican mega-donor Willis Johnson, who lives in Tennessee. Some critics have accused Nome of turning the National Guard into a private mercenary force targeting migrants. Our next guests obtained documents that indicate this same force, the South Dakota National Guard, will be deployed to suppress land and water defenders resisting pipelines. We are also joined by Bruce Ellison, water protector and land back attorney in Rapid City. Um, can you talk about, Bruce, um, what these documents show that you've gotten a hold of? Good morning, Amy. Uh, thank you for having me on. Essentially, what seems to be evolving is not just the militarization of our police forces, but particularly the active deployment and involvement of National Guard troops in the suppression of resistance to fossil fuel industry and, and other activities. And that's aside from the private use that you that you uh, referenced earlier, where are we going with this? Essentially, the documents that we got had to do with plans for the now ended KXL pipeline and how the South Dakota National Guard was going to be the main force to ensure that the pipeline, 315 miles, was constructed and that they would be guarding not only construction operations, but also equipment, and interestingly enough, including the use of lethal force. So what we're finding is, is that— Wait, wait, wait. Uh, that, can you talk more about what that means? The South Dakota National Guard can kill people to protect a pipeline. Um, Essentially, yes, they can. It can be used to defense of others, of course, but also defense of property. And the uh, standards um, have to do with if other means cannot reasonably be uh, used to stop destruction of property or someone who's leaving believed to have destroyed property, lethal force can be used. What, what What's happening is that we look at an evolution from, say, Standing Rock, where the National Guard played a role. They manned checkpoints. Uh, they drove trucks around with food and, and other equipment. That has then evolved to current plans or for the KXL pipeline, which would be active deployment. I mean, these would be not only so-called civil disorder forces, but they would be backed up by regular troops who would be armed with automatic weapons. This was deployed a little bit about a year ago uh, around the protest uh, near Mount Rushmore when Trump was visiting by land back uh, people who were trying to raise issues, uh, as I said, near Mount Rushmore. Um, we saw that real first combination of the active use of the military from being in the back to being in the front. So you have the first news that— um <clears throat> Governor Noem is boasting about that she got a mega donor, a Republican donor, billionaire donor, to pay for National Guard's people to be sent to the border. Um, will these people the National Guard use to protect pipeline and go after water protectors be paid for by the company? Well, that's an interesting question, because South Dakota established what they call the peace fund and had required uh, TransCanada to put up to $20 million into this peace fund to be used for anything having to do with construction of the pipeline. It's a slightly different form, but still we're talking about the use of our National Guard to support uh, multinational uh, hazardous transportation and, and extraction industries uh, in the United States, particularly the the fossil fuel industry. What's unique about the current situation with the private donor is, according to the Rapid City Journal, our, our local paper, he called up Christy Noem and said, 
asked her if she wanted to send National Guard troops to the border uh, because they have similar attitudes about brown and red people trying who are seeking asylum or who are refugees and offered up to a million dollars to help that happen for a 30 to a 60 day deployment. And there's discussion now about they're going to only be using volunteers. Who are the people within the Guard who are going to volunteer and want to go down on the border and engage in these kinds of actions to prevent people just seeking a, a better life or even their own survival? Um, and and so it, it's it's a very dangerous precedent. Right wing agenda, privately funded use of our National Guard essentially as cheap mercenary troops. They're not even being paid the what what security contractors normally get that hundred and fifty thousand dollars tax free. They're being paid their normal minimum wage uh, jobs, but they're working for a billionaire hmm. who has an agenda, like our governor, who has the same agenda. So, from South Dakota up to northern Minnesota, Tara Hauska, is this the first you're hearing of this? Does it surprise you? And can you talk about not only the National Guard being used, but the role of U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents in dealing with the Line 3 um, uh, water protector protesters? I have to say, I'm not super surprised. Uh, actually, there was just a bill, uh, H.R. 1374, the Energy Policy and Security Act, that just passed the House. And it essentially provides both a, a method for private actors, private industry, to directly work with states and create energy security uh, policy. And it also provides federal funding to for states to create energy security plans, specifically around critical infrastructure, which includes pipelines and extractive industry. Um, it seems like it's basically like responding directly to situations like the Enbridge Corporation here in Minnesota, which is engaged in a public safety escrow trust where it's paying our police directly to, uh, I, I mean, it's incentivizing our police to target, sur harass, surveil water protectors um, and reimburse them for all the costs of doing so. That's why we see 50, 60 squad cars here in a on a dirt road. Uh, blockading us in our driveway. I mean, they're getting paid by the company to do it. And as as far as the uh, National Guard and all that and the militarization goes, I mean, we've seen Customs Border Patrol drones over our camp for years. Um, there's been Customs, you know, Department of Homeland Security helicopters over protests. Um, there's been Department of Homeland Security helicopters over our private property, our encampment. Um, it's something where you're seeing a... a very concerted effort to surveil, harass, and target indigenous-led movement. Before I ask you uh, a slightly different question about what has happened throughout Canada, yesterday being the Canada Day for protests, let me ask you about these sex trafficking charges. Um, what do you know about them? Two men working on the Enbridge Line 3 charged with sex trafficking. I know that's the second tra sex trafficking ring that's been busted that's had Enbridge employees in it in the months that they've been here in our territory. I know that we told and warned the state, uh, we warned the governor and lieutenant governor, Peggy Flanagan, that this would happen, and it did. Uh, a 30-minute training or even a day training to employees um, is just not enough. These people are here in our state. They're mostly from out of state. There's 5,000 mostly out of state workers here constructing Lane 3. They are growing increasingly aggressive. Actually, yesterday at, at the demonstration, one of the workers attempted to drive a vehicle uh, running over protesters um, on site. Uh, uh, these people are here to destroy the territory. They are not interested in developing relationships or being accountable to our communities because they're not. Finally, uh, the, the protests all over Canada Thursday on Canada Day following the recent discovery of graves and remains of First Nations children at government-run schools. Tara, you are Ojibwe from the Kochi Ching First Nation. Can you talk about this? It is a um, it's a, a gut punch that I think a lot of us already knew. Um, but it's, it's hard still to see those numbers and to know all those lives and all those generations that are missing, all those voices and people that belong to us that were taken um, by the uh, residential schools and by the, the boarding school era. Um, 
I mean, I think it's it's a very stark reminder of what we have to come to terms with in terms of um, looking at the treatment of Indigenous people, both by Canada and the United States and around the world, uh, the attempts to eradicate us and the continued efforts to do so through uh, out-of-home placement of children and you know, destruction of our land, our territories, um, theft of so many different aspects of our people. Tara Haska, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, that does it for our show. Indigenous lawyer and activist, founder of the Ginu Collective, and also Bruce Ellison, water protector and land back attorney. I'm Amy Goodman. Have a good weekend. Be safe.